Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Aviation Thermal Management. When to use heat pipes, high K plates, vapor chambers, and conduction cooling. Sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and TechBreeze Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with TechBreeze Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. John Hartenstein, Manager of Aerospace Products, has been with ACT since 2005. He has over 27 years experience in research and product development engineering, focusing on advanced thermal management, including heat pipes. He's a co-inventor on three U.S. patents and has co-authored over 30 papers. Also on the line is Dr. Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson is the Chief Engineer at Advanced Cooling Technologies. He has over 30 years experience in two-phase heat transfer. He has designed and developed a number of unique heat transfer devices. For the last few years, Dr. Anderson has been developing high temperature heat pipes and radiators for nuclear fission and electric propulsion, as well as working on thermal management systems for full authority digital engine control and other avionics boxes. Now, before we begin, I also want to mention that if you would like a PDF of today's presentation, please request a copy in the question box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will then contact you and send the PDF after the presentation. So at this time, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, John Hartenstein. John? Great. Thank you, Billy. Um, the webinar this afternoon is entitled Aviation Thermal Management, When to Use Heat Pipes, High Cape Plates, Vapor Chambers, and conduction cooling. We'll get started with a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. We'll start with the motivation, followed by some discussions on baseline aluminum plates, and getting into benefits of use and selection criteria for heat pipes, high K plates, vapor chambers, and encapsulated conduction cooling, uh, and then taking a look at some trade studies. Finally, we'll wrap up the, the presentation and we'll take some questions. The motivation for this webinar is to address some of the unique cooling challenges facing avionics uh, design engineers where key components must be maintained below specific temperatures. There are several, several uh, patches of thermal technologies within the design engineer's toolbox, including conduction cooling, heat pipes, high K or high conductivity plates, and vapor chambers. One of the questions that is often asked is, uh, what are the design criteria used when conducting trade studies involving these technologies? So this webcast will, will address that. All these are standard methods for moving heat from electronics over short distances to a location where the heat can be removed by liquid or forced air cooling. So we'll start off with just some basics on with conduction cooling. Um, simple baseline conduction, there's no two-phase component here. Conduction cooling from least expensive to most expensive is standard aluminum, followed by heat spreaders, doublers like diamond and encapsulated conduction plates. Today we will focus on aluminum and encapsulated conduction plates. So the simplest method to cool electronics is by conduction through an aluminum plate. Um, typically 6063 and 6061 are commonly used to cool the electronics, and they also provide structural support. At times there is a need to enhance the baseline aluminum if it cannot meet the power and mass requirements where you will need to consider other conduction technologies or heat pipes. Uh, copper is not commonly used, uh, mainly due to its density. So we're starting off with the, some baseline conduction cooling, and then we're going to get into high K plates and vapor chambers. But before we do that, we need to just address some basics with heat pipes. Heat pipes are passive two-phase heat transfer devices. They utilize uh, late, the latent heat of the fluid to very effectively transfer heat across their length. Looking at the figure at the top left portion of the slide, the evaporator area will be placed beneath your heat generating components. Heat is gathered uh, and input into the heat pipe, which causes the fluid to vaporize. The vapor then moves along the center of the heat pipe to a colder region passively due to the inherited pressure gradient within the pipe. At the colder region, the condenser um, it, it condenses back into a liquid, and then the liquid is, is pumped back to the evaporator using capillary action provided by a wick structure. An analogy were to be, if you were to take a napkin and dip it into your coffee, how it pulls it up, that's the same pumping mechanism of how the fluid is returned from the condenser to the evaporator. 
Overall, the heat pipes have a, have a, t a temperature differential of 2 to 5 degrees across the length. They can be used by themselves or in conjunction with other metal components within the system. They have thermal conductivities anywhere from 10,000 to 200,000 watts per meter K, and heat fluxes in the 50 to 75 watts per square centimeter range. Temperature, height against gravity, and acceleration are typical limitations for these passive two-phase cooling devices. Uh, heat pipe performance curves that you can see on the right are plotted from ACT's online uh, calculator where we, where we plotted um, power as a function of uh, temperature for a specific heat pipe design. In this case, it's an 8-inch long pipe with a 2-inch long evaporator, 2-inch long condenser. The plot on the top is for operation horizontal. The plot below is for 4 inches against gravity. The curves are for a number of different pipe diameters. So if you note from these curves that, a, that for a standard wick, um, the, this, these curves are for a standard wick that improved performance can be achieved with enhancements to the wick design. One of the things you can see from these curves is that for water pipes, you can effectively transfer heat above 30 degrees C, taking a look at the slope of the curve. One of the questions that's often been asked is how far can a heat pipe operate against gravity? Uh, water heat pipes can operate roughly 9 to 10 inches above the condenser. Also, um, Heat pipes can work at lower temperatures, but for a water heat pipe below zero, obviously the, the pipe will freeze. So it's not typically an issue for electronics cooling because the environment itself is providing the cooling. Once the power is turned on, the heat pipe will thaw out and start to transport power. It's also important to note that properly manufactured heat pipes can operate over many freeze-thaw cycles. So let's take a look at spot cooling. Uh, heat pipes are used for, for three typical purposes. One, if you're looking to move power from point A to point B. Two, if you're looking to spread the thermal load. And three, if you're looking to isothermalize a surface. So in this case, spot cooling refers to cooling discrete components moving heat off a chip to a remote heat sink. So if you take a look at the, the picture in the top right, the, the, what's shown there, you have two copper water heat pipes that are soldered in, into a, an aluminum mounting plate. You can see bosses within those plates. Under those bosses were, were processors. So what we were doing is pulling heat off those processors, processors effectively using heat pipes and then transferring the thermal load up to a liquid cold rail at the top. So what are some of the selection parameters for spot cooling heat pipes? Uh, these just have the same benefits as regular heat pipes. They are uh, relatively low cost. They have a high connectivity, passive operation, 9 to 10 inch um, maximum height, and heat fluxes up to around 75 watts a square centimeter, lightweight and flexible. They can be made into countless geometries. They also have the ability to meet demanding environmental conditions such as stringent operational and, and survival temperatures, shock and vibration, etc. They are typically not structural elements, and they, they uh, transfer heat in one direction. Continuing on, high K plates are embedded heat pipe plates where you take the isothermal properties of heat pipes, embed them into a standard aluminum plate with either epoxy or solder to increase the overall conductivity. The heat pipes are strategically placed to get good thermal results without affecting the current geometry or mounting features. The heat pipes plus solder are similar in weight to that of aluminum, but with a conductivity nearly three to five times greater than that of the wrought aluminum itself. These plates can also be used as structural components within the system. Shown here is a thermal analysis of an aluminum plate containing many high power electrical components with and without embedded pipes. The picture in the far left are model results of aluminum plate without any heat pipes. You can see there are three hotspot locations on that plate. The picture in the middle is the same aluminum plate, but now with heat pipes embedded into the plate strategically placed. You can see that the max temperature has dropped about 20 degrees and, that uniform, and it's fairly uniform in temperature. The picture on the right is the actual hardware itself, and the silver lines you see there are actually the location of where the heat pipes were embedded into the plate. So what are some of the selection criteria, the parameters for high K plates? Again, same as the heat pipe benefits, the high connectivity passive, heat, same type of heat fluxes. Uh, we have been able to achieve high K plates as thin as 1.83 millimeters without reducing the overall power capacity. In addition, in addition uh, maximum height for a high K plate is around 18 to 20 inches with heat pipes positioned across the plate from each other. There are some options with the plate materials. 
uh, with aluminum magnesium and aluminum silicon carbide. With aluminum, we've achieved thermal conductivities between 600 to 1200 watts per meter K. With magnesium, between 450 to 800 watts per meter K. These are strong, this, this, this type of technology is strongly used for conduction cooled cards. For example, the top two pictures you see on the, on the right show a conduction cooled card with heat pipes that have been incorporated into the plates themselves, pulling power off of the sensitive components deep within the card and transferring the power um, with a very low thermal resistance over to the edge for, uh, so you can transfer the thermal load into the card guides within a chassis. So next we're going to take a look at a case study evaluating high K plates. The objective here is to see what kind of a reduction in weight and size can be realized using a high K plate compared to an aluminum extrusion to maintain the same thermal performance. So for a standard heat sink, it was aluminum heat sink, 12 inch long evaporator, uh, 0.6 inch thick base thickness, and had a weight of 9.6 pounds. By introducing heat pipes into it, we introduced uh, uh, five heat pipes into the design three over the, the heat input location and two outside of, of that area to improve with spreading. So we were able to reduce the, the, the overall length from 12 to 10 inches, the thickness from 0.6 to 0.28, which resulted in a weight reduction of from 9.6 to 6.3 pounds, a 35% reduction. If you take a look at the, the, the same, um, the, the same uh, conditions, here are some actual thermo, uh, thermal images to demonstrate the improvement. The high K uh, heat sink shown on the right more effectively spreads the heat, the heat as can be seen by the yellow area surrounding the source, even though the heat sink is shorter, lighter, and thinner. The improvement is directly attributable to the addition of heat pipes, which can be seen as a red line in the picture on the right. So let's talk about vapor chambers. Uh, vapor chambers like conventional cylindrical heat pipes, uh, they transport heat from a heat source to a heat sink with a very small temperature gradient. Vapor chamber heat pipes are often used to access, accept heat from a small high heat flux source and transfer the heat to a much larger lower heat flux sink where the heat uh, can be effectively dissipated. The main benefits of vapor chambers is that they are nearly isothermal to within one or two degrees. They can, can be used to cool multiple components and be made as thin as three millimeters. They also have a very low thermal resistance. Heat fluxes are similar to that of heat pipes, but you can increase the heat flux with wick enhancements. Some of the main limitations are that they are higher in cost compared to high K plates and, can be, uh, and cannot be used as, as an overall structure. Another limitation for standard water vapor chambers is the max temperature is around 105 degrees. From the pictures that you see there, you can see the vapor chamber internals on the lower left, the assembled vapor chamber in the center, and then the typical vapor chamber components on the right. So what are some of the selection parameters for vapor chambers? Uh, again, main benefits, the same as with, with heat pipes, is they have high conductivity passive, maximum dimensions of around 10 inches to, by 20 inches, heat flux is around 75 watts a square centimeter for typical wick designs. But there can be enhancements with the envelope material to promote direct die attach, such instead of using just all copper design, uh, using aluminum nitride direct bond copper. And you can see some of the pictures for the, the, uh, the aluminum nitride direct brown copper shown in the, the smaller picture in the center and the, and the up picture uh, above the, the three there. Next, we'll briefly address encapsulated conduction cooling. First, materials like diamond or diamond composite exhibit high conductivity but are expensive over large areas. Metal composites and pyrolytic graphites are brittle, uh, hygroscopic, and can have relatively low strength. But this has been improved by encapsulating the graphite within a metallic shell for protection and strength with a high conductivity core. So some of the, also in addition, some of the reports have documented thermal conductivities for this type of structures around 550 watts per meter K. So in summary, with the, the encapsulated pyrolytic graphite, the in-plane conductivity of the graphite itself is between 1,000 to 1,500 watts per meter K. The out-of-plane conductivity is around 10. The encapsulate plus and the thermal vias, which we will discuss, we will discuss next, lowers the thermal conductivity, which is an a, a overall function of the material structure itself. So expanding a little more on the, on the encapsulated pyrolytic graphite, uh, with the encapsulated graphite, the thermal load is transferred into the structure through thermal vias. 
So you can see the triangular shaped vias as well as the APG and the encapsulate and the figure on the right. Also, you can see some of the, the steps there for, for manufacturing. The manufacturing is, is a fairly rigorous and involved process and can be relatively expensive compared to uh, other two-phase heat transfer uh, devices. And again, thermal conductivity is reported in the 550 watt per meter K range. So what is the selection criteria for the encapsulated conduction cooling? The main benefits are that they can be made to be thin, they have a thermal conductivity that's higher compared to aluminum. They are not affected by acceleration or gravity, so they can be used in applications where sustained high accelerations are required or where the heat pipes cannot be oriented favorably. They also have a wide temperature range, especially at lower temperatures where water heat pipes are not effective. They have a lower density compared to two-phase systems and have a long transport, thermal transport length. Some of the limits are they have a higher cost compared to passive two-phase uh, heat transfer devices a lower thermal conductivity compared to two-phase, and also high flux chip locations are fixed at the design compared to um, uh, common vapor chambers. In addition, conductance has shown to drop off um, as, a, as, a, as a function of thermal cycling. So we ran some, uh, some trade studies taking a look at a, a general plate, a uh, common plate nine inches long by four inches wide with a thickness of 0.12 inches thick. We put a 50-watt heat load over five square centimeters at one end of the plate, and we evaluated two sink conditions. The first was a half-inch long coal rail set at 25 degrees at the far end of the plate, and the other was a simulated forced air heat sink on the entire backside of, of the plate. So we took, took a look at five um, case studies. The first was through, with a standard 6063 aluminum plate. The second with, was with an encapsulated conduction plate with a uniform conduct, um, conductivity of 550 watts per meter K a high K uh, plate with a uniform conductance of 1,000 watts per meter K, and then the same, a, a high K plate with heat pipes positioned into it optimal for, for a particular or, um, configuration. We also took a look at copper water vapor chambers. So the figures that you see below uh, at the bottom, you see a coal rail high K plate and a conv uh, convection high K plate. So for the coal rail high K plate, you can see the location of where the heat pipes have been placed. So in this case, we're trying to, the heat pipes have been placed under the heat source, and we're trying to transport the thermal load out to the 25 degrees C cold rail at the other end. For the convection portion for a high K plate to, to take heat off the back side of the plate, we have heat pipes that are mounted directly under the heat source, but then the heat pipes are spread uniformly throughout the plate to get better um, spreading and improve the backside um, uh, heat transfer performance. So in the cold rail cooling case, the aluminum plate exhibits the maximum temperature of 100 or 210 degrees C. Uh, the maximum temperature drops if we regress from 550 watts per meter K for the, the um, encapsulated conduction plate to a generalized high K, high K plate to an optimized high K plate, and finally a vapor chamber. So as you can see, there's a significant reduction in temperature using passive two-phase cooling approach. You get improved results with higher effective thermal conductivity. So for the convection cooling case, we see a similar progression in thermal performance across the different cooling technologies. On the optimum high K plate design, you can see the thermal patterns uh, for, from the heat pipe spreading the thermal load across the plate surface, which improves the convection side heat transfer. That's the, that's the view uh, third from the left. In addition, you can see that the vapor chamber shows further improvements over a high K plate as a result of 2D spreading. An additional case study was, was um, uh, generated to took, take a look at cooling discrete heat sources over a common plate, evaluating high K plates and vapor chambers. In this case, convection cooling off the backside of the plate provided the heat sink. There were multiple one square centimeter location and heat loads ranging from 10 to 200 watts per square centimeter placed over the plate. So you can see, if you, as you look at the results here, that the low heat flux components almost disappear and that the higher heat fluxes tend to spread the thermal load. So one, one takeaway from here is if you want to keep something isothermal as possible, you would want to use a vapor chamber. So as a result, we generated a table to summarize each technology discussed, uh, evaluating density, spreading, 
thermal conductivity, maximum heat flux, minimum thickness, maximum height, and relative cost. You can see from top to bottom progressing from, from least expensive to most expensive. And so this table will assist the design engineer conducting thermal trades for their applications. A couple of things I want to point out here. Under the spreading column, you see uh, 2D and 1D cooling. Um, you also see, for, you know, as I said earlier, for spot cooling, for regular heat pipe, a regular heat pipe, it's, in, it's uh, 1D cooling. But for a high K plate, it shows 1.5D cooling. What's meant by that? So we have the heat pipe that's transferring a thermal load from, from one end to the other, but in a high K plate, it's embedded within the aluminum structure. It's all, you're also seeing some spreading within that plate, so it, we, you get some additional benefit there. In addition, under the heat, maximum heat flux column, you see a, a designation that says depends on geometry. Uh, this means not, this, uh, what this means is it's not a heat flux limit, but a limit on chip temperature. One thing I want to point out is two-phase heat transfer devices weigh more compared to aluminum or encapsulated graphite for a given thickness, but they have a higher overall thermal conductivity. So as a result, the specific thermal conductivity wins out by comparison. So uh, selection criteria summary, I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, aluminum uh, plates, 200 watts per meter K, 2D, cheapest solution. Heat plates, 10,000 to 100,000 watts per meter K, 1D, used for discrete point cooling. IK plates, 600 to 1,200 watts per meter K, uh, 1.5D for strategic thermal spreading. Vapor chamber is 5,000 to 100,000. Expensive compared to high K plates, but they can be isothermal to within one or two degrees. And encapsulated conduction systems, uh, reported 550 watts per meter K, uh, 2D uh, heat transfer. Expensive, but they have sustained high. They can have sustained high accelerations, operation at lower temperatures, and vertical heights greater than 20 inches. So wrapping up, uh, we hope that this presentation this afternoon provided some assistance to the design engineer provided, providing some direction as to the use and benefits and selection criteria for these technologies. So I want to thank you for joining us, and thanks, thank you to those who have submitted questions. Uh, Bill Anderson has been reviewing the questions as, it, as they've been coming in, and will answer as many as possible within the allotted time remaining. If you don't get an answer to your question, we will re respond with an email shortly. Thanks, John. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. So if you have a question out there, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. And now I'd like to welcome to the line uh, Dr. Bill Anderson. Bill, we already have uh, some questions here in the queue. Uh, the first one here we have, uh, what are the approximate delivery times for heat pipes, high K plates, vapor chambers, uh, and enhanced conduction cards? Okay, for heat pipes and small volume, you're typically talking about three to four weeks after receipt of order. For high K plates and vapor chambers, it's typically eight to 10 weeks. And for encapsulated conduction, it's generally greater than 10 weeks, depending on the complexity of the uh, design. Can heat pipes be used at temperatures lower than 25 degrees Celsius? Uh, definitely. The 25 degrees C limit is really referring to only to heat pipes with water as a working fluid. Uh, ammonia heat pipes for spacecraft thermal control operate down to about minus 65. Methanol pipes uh, operate down to about minus 50. And other fluids can operate at lower temperatures, well below minus 200 degrees C. Here's another question. What sets the minimum survival temperature limit for two-phase systems? What we have is what we have normally seen as people suggest uh, minus the specifications we have seen normally say minus 55 degrees C. And so that's what we've specified in this webinar. Um, that, that's actually not a real limit. We have had some titanium water heat pipes cold soaked by NASA down to minus 115 degrees C and uh, then successfully restarted. What is the largest high K plate that can be fabricated? As John mentioned, we can only go about uh, 20 degree, 20 inches from top to bottom when it both the, you cool the top and bottom. If you're going to have a not near horizontal system, then you can have a much larger high K plate. We have fabricated a high K plate with both water and methanol heat pipes that was 50 inches by 24 inches. The effective thermal conductivity from one end to the other of that was 2,500 watt per meter K. So we were well, kind of getting in the range that you can only see normally with diamond. 
Here's a question from an attendee. What is the heat reduction after application of the heat pipe, for instance, on a 100-watt chip with 180 degrees Fahrenheit? I mean, really, we would have to know kind of heat fluxes, size of the chips, how far you're transferring stuff, the heat sink and all, because all those factor in. But typically, what you have is to get heat out with a spot cooling with a heat pipe, you will have the temperature drops from whatever the thing is mounted on into the copper uh, heat pipe envelope and wick, about a two degree C drop along the heat pipe length, and then uh, heat, uh, another temperature drop going back out to the sink. And I mean, if, if you'd send us details, we can we can provide more exact information. But 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 generally, um, you, you use. With the high K plates and all, we're typically seeing a 22 degree C drop. With a, just a spot cooling heat pipe, we can get mar much larger drops. Are there other working fluids other than water, and is internal corrosion an issue? There are a lot of other. Okay, when you're talking about electronics cooling, water is by far the f best fluid in terms of its physical properties. Um, there are a lot of other fluids. Like I said, you can have ammonia and methanol at lower temperatures. At higher temperatures, you can have alkali metal things going up in super alloys up to 1,100 degrees C and higher in refractory metals. So you get, there's a whole range of uh, working fluids that you s select based on your temperature range. But one, one heat pipe fluid typically covers kind of a couple, up to 100, 150 degrees C, maybe a little more. In terms of corrosion, we don't normally see corrosion problems with heat pipe wicks and envelopes that are known to be compatible with the working fluid. Um, people have, have tested copper water heat pipes or I've tested them for more than 30 years without problems. I think aluminum ammonia heat pipes have had similar life tests. So you can have very, very long life without any maintenance or corrosion issues. Uh, what impact would phase change materials have on the performance of heat pipes or high-K plates? Okay, if, if you when you're talking about a high acceleration type system where your heat pipe might stop operating momentarily, the phase change materials actually help you because they give you a buffer when the heat pipe is not operating but keeping the temperature low. In other cases, when you're just you're talking about storing something, they really have no effect on the heat pipe performance itself. What is the minimum diameter of a water heat pipe? Uh, 0 0.062 inches. 0 0.62. 0 0.62. 16th of an inch. Now, we can actually, in some cases, we can flatten things down to get them a little bit flatter but that's kind of a minimum diameter to be carrying significant amounts of power. Here's another question from an attendee. What kind of plating do you put on the plates, and how does that affect the performance? Is there a large difference in conduction between the use uh, of solder or thermal grease when using uh, heat pipes in a plate? I mean, when the heat pipes are put in a plate, they're typically soldered in place if if there's a real thermal performance limit, if there's a slightly less one, we will epoxy them. We normally don't put thermal grease unless it's something we want to be making and breaking. But if you want to turn about what the effect is, basically that's just an additional thermal resistance that you have to take into account when you're modeling the system. Can you use heat pipes or vapor chambers to transfer heat over a range of temperatures? Definitely. The, the heat pipe, for example, a water heat pipe, you can have them operating from a roughly 25 degrees C up to 270 degrees C. The actual operating point that the heat pipe operates at is determined by the, resist, the power in, the geometry and all going into the heat pipe, and then the heat sink conditions. So that when you have a water heat pipe, it doesn't automatically operate at... Uh, to 100 degrees C because that's the atmospheric pressure of what, which water boils. It can operate over that very wide range. 
We have time for one or two more questions. Here's one. What is the maximum distance that a heat pipe can have between uh, the evaporator and the condenser, such as using a fluid of NH3? Okay, it really depends on your, your setup. With a water heat pipe, you can go fairly long distances, maybe 20 or 30 inches, um, as long as it's kind of vertical, much shorter if it's horizontal. Ammonia heat pipes are typically used in spacecraft with very large uh, grooves. So they have very high permeability. So you can get them operating over like three meters or so, carrying significant power, but they, they basically only work in space. This will be our, our last question. Can you speak at all to any technology focused towards uh, automotive power electronics cooling for, say, hybrid cars? I, I guess I can just say we're looking at that, but we don't have any products right now specifically for cars. All right, we'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Uh, again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question today, our sponsors uh, have your questions and we'll do their best to address them after today's presentation. So thanks to everyone for joining us and thanks again to John Hartenstein and Dr. Bill Anderson. Just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.